good to go. All right, great. All right, thanks everybody for being here. Um, bear with me, I have a bunch of info that I'm gonna try to squeak through as quickly as I can. And maybe I'll do it this way. Nope. Oh. No. I think we're frozen. No, it's probably not you. I'm wondering okay. if Camtasia is locking it up. Every now and then we run into that, so sorry. might work perfect all right thank you so much so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself um, I'm a dairy nutrient management inspector for Washington State Department of Agriculture uh, my core work is evolved around inspecting all licensed dairies in Washington State following up on investigations and also providing technical assistance to our dairy producers but I'm also going to give you a little bit of background about myself and also be fully honest with you, I do not have a dairy background or even a, an animal agriculture background, so it's been a learning curve for me. So I'm gonna tell you how I am connected to agriculture and how I am connected to water quality. So my background, I grew up in central Washington. Uh, my parents were third generation farmers, but of the apple and cherry variety. Um, that means I spent my summers on top of a ladder picking cherries, for the record. Now, just because I grew up in the rain shadow of the North Cascades Mountains doesn't mean I ever went without water. I was lucky enough to grow up at the confluence of the Wenatchee and the mighty Columbia River. I was able to spend my weekends and my summers here. This is Lake Wenatchee. It's about six miles long and it's glacier fed and it was the source of our drinking water and also lots of summer recreation and tiny amounts of torture in the winter months <laughs> when we would do our polar bear swim. Now, I'm going to fast forward a couple years and I'm going to tie in uh, surface water and runoff. So uh, in my 20s, 30s, I moved down to Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, this right here is Grand Falls. It's about 30 miles outside of Flagstaff, uh, located on the Navajo Reservation. And most of the year, it's bone dry. Not much to look at, but a, a pretty staircase, per se. But after snow melt or heavy monsoon rains, we do get a great deal of runoff. And you can tell by the color. Uh, it's like a chocolate waterfall. There's a great amount of sediment load. It goes all the way down to the confluence of the Little Colorado and the Colorado River. If you've ever rafted that, you probably saw it, and that's at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Now, today, I deal with uh, surface water runoff at a different magnitude, thankfully so. Uh, where I live now, I'm up in the far left corner of Washington State. I work in three counties, Watkins, Gadget, Snohomish County. We're right below the Canadian border, and we're nestled right next to the Puget Sound and the beautiful San Juan Islands. Now, where we live, the average rainfall is about 40 to 60 inches of rainfall per year. Uh, it's a recreational hot spot. I think we had over 700 inches of snow on Mount Baker, our, our ski area this year. Uh, we have a very high amount of rural residential areas, agriculture, and that would include both commercial and lifestyle or hobby farms, as they're sometimes referred to. And also, at the base of this is our shellfish farms. We have shellfish farms located in our um, at the outlets of some of our major rivers in Thailand. And recently, they, over the last eight years, there's been an identified problem with an increase in fecal coliform bacteria levels <coughs> impairing our shellfish harvest areas. Um, and as we know, shellfish farmers rely on clean water to provide a safe uh, commodity to <coughs> give to their customers who might be consuming the shellfish raw or undercooked. So fecal coliform bacteria is obviously an identified concern and primary sources could be human from failing septic systems, liverboard boats, morages, recreation areas that have improper uh, facilities. Also livestock, pets, and wildlife have been identified as contributors. In 2011, our governor signed the Shellfish Initiative. He had major goals to uh, reopen or reclassify some of our closed or conditionally closed shellfish harvest areas. And uh, some of the targets that he set for that was to increase on-site septic inspections to have those up to date and also to increase the number of ag BMPs that are in place. Now this is a huge undertaking, and this is just, I'm just working in three counties, and there's many counties across the state who are working on this. Uh, so many of these efforts are coordinated by our uh, PIC programs, and our PIC programs are pollution identification and correction programs, and uh, they're really a fantastic thing. Quite often the PIC program is housed in a local government agency, like our, our county agencies, but highly supported at a state and federal level, level, and also by other stakeholders, including our tribes, farmers, citizen groups, conservation districts, et cetera. Now, WSDA's role in part of this program is to continue with our core work of supporting our dairy producers,
but also through uh, grant funding, we've been able to develop and create a source ID water sampling program. So the source ID sampling program is different than ambient, and just briefly, that means that we're basically chasing water runoff. We're not going out every Tuesday just to see what happens every Tuesday of the third Tuesday of the month. We're gonna be sampling around all users of dairy nutrients, because we are WSDA. So that could mean that we're sampling around farms, dairy fields, and other crop users who might be using dairy nutrients as a soil amendment. Uh, we do this work in three counties, and our three counties do have large watersheds, lots of subbasins, and the issue is even more complex because we do have two of our major watersheds originate across the border in Canada and also contribute uh, high fecal coliform levels into our local watershed. So we have a lot of info that we're collecting. Just to give you an example, I might bring in 50 water quality samples per day during a rain event, and I'm not the only one out there sampling. There may be seven different agencies sampling at that time. So we've run into the issue of how do we share our data. Uh, for the longest time, we would just create our own maps like that one and hand write our, our sample results in there and email it to one of our partners. Or we would share our lab results. We put it in a pretty graph that made sense to our really analytical partners, but maybe not so much to our uh, of our other groups. Um, so having all this data uh, was really great, but it made it even harder for our field staff to pull together to make sense of it and to know where to follow up. And if it was hard for us to figure out, you have to really understand it was hard for our general public to, to wrap around. So even though there was lots of data available, it might not be um, easy for them to link that data to recent weather events or land management practices. Uh, there might be so much data that it was overwhelming or not even timely because they might not get the data until the next quarter public, public meeting. So we identified that we really needed to come up with a way to, to make this better. We needed to find a way that uh, we could take the results, make it easy to find, easy to assimilate, and help people correlate their actions and their land management practices to, to recent events. So what we did is we created an online results <coughs> map. And I have to tell you, this wasn't just something that WSDA did. We worked really closely with our partners, the Department of Ecology, and we had support from people uh, in other agencies who might have had stronger GIS skills than we did, because we didn't have a lot to start with. So uh, we were able to kind of branch out and work together to create this online map. Now, the great thing about the online map is it's available to anybody who has a web connection. So it's available at home, it's available from your iPhone, it's available from your iPad. You can check it out from the convenience of your couch or from the front seat of your tractor. Uh, and just a few details here about our, our surface, our water quality map. As I mentioned, it's online. And what we have here is we have a series of gray dots. This is just a couple counties here. The gray dots show historic sites where we've sampled before, but we might not have sampled in the last couple weeks. We wanted to keep our data timely and relevant because water quality can <coughs> change from minute to minute to hour to hour and certainly day by day. So we didn't want to have all of our historical water data, water data available. However, if the user wanted to, they could click on one of those dots and they could pull up our most recent water quality sampling event on there and also historic data. Uh, and then our other dots, we had basically used a stoplight cartography. Green being good, water quality is great, it's within the standards. Yellow means it's exceeded the standards and Orange and red means, whoa, we've really kind of blown it out of proportion. And you'll notice that some of the sizes even get bigger. And that uh, can tell you that the water quality was really egregious in those areas. Now, some of the other great benefits of our uh, water quality map is that we put it on a satellite image. This allowed people to easily hone in, because if you look at people on a map, they always want to know where they live. How does this affect where their, where their house is? So it allows them to hone in on their house but it also allows them to view things at a larger watershed scale. We've also learned that people don't necessarily know what a watershed means or that they actually can influence people seven miles downstream. That's, that's sometimes lost. So we wanted to show, uh, we have surface water on there because so it can show the, the movement and direction of surface water on the map. And it can also correlate other land uses. So whether it's uh, rural residential, whether it's a wooded area, agriculture, and the satellite imagery is so good that you can even see some of the swales where water, where water moves through. Now, some of the successful outcomes of this endeavor uh, is that data is instantly available. We're using preliminary results from our lab, so usually if I pull the sample on Tuesday, I can have this map updated by Thursday. Um, and then we'll go back through at a later date and change the results to final, but we find that the less than 10% of the time there's inaccuracies. It's usually spot on. Uh, so we can put our prelim data up there right away, 
and it allows our field staff and partners to really focus and hone in their resources and efforts where it's needed. So for example, right here on the bottom left, we have a, a scene there, and it's probably what a field staff person would see when they get out of the car and they're getting ready to pull a sample. There's a roadside ditch, we have a lateral ditch right there coming in. They might not know that it's a seasonal ditch or that the water, which way the water's flowing, when the last time a sample was collected, was it high, was it good, is it an area of concern? But what they can do by if they can pull this up on their iPhone or their iPad, and they can see where the recent sample sites where they were taken, oh my gosh, they're red, they were high. You can actually uh, click on that, drill down, and you can see how high they were. Um, and then using our satellite imagery, you can also see where water moves across the landscape. You can see those swales, you can see the map ditches, and you can even add additional GIS layers if you like to see where local dairy farms are, livestock areas, crop uses, etc. Now, the other great thing about this is because we are collecting all of this data and mapping where we're seeing elevated fecal coliform numbers, it kind, of, it kind of starts a little, it starts conversation and it holds a little bit of accountability. So right now we've been sampling along the border and uh, we have identified probably a number of reaches where we continue to see elevated fecal coliform coming down from Canada. Uh, and so there's these bright red dots always right at the border. <laughs> and so what it's done is actually, it's created a partnership, it's opened a dialogue, it's created a partnership with our, with our partners across the border to continually to, to work and to identify, to show that there's an existing and ongoing problem and that they can continue to work to identify and correct those issues. Uh, for the public, it's, I, just can't, I could just gush about this. It's increased awareness, transparency, and access, and I'll start from the bottom down. I've already talked about how people can access the results from their home. They don't have to contact the local uh, county agency to try to find out what the recent results were. Um, it's transparency. We're a government agency and a lot of our partners are government agencies and they want to know what we're doing driving around in their neighborhood. It, it shows that the work that we're doing is warranted because we continue to see high results there and we're sharing the, the fruits of our labor. We're sharing those results. And then the awareness. So I have encouraging dialogue up at the top and so if I'm out in the field pulling samples, I will often almost always have a farmer pull up and stop and talk to me. And he'll, he'll want to know, well, what's happening with the water quality? I've been updating my map every week and I haven't seen any changes, so I have to politely just tell him I have a sample here in two weeks, you know? <laughs> but keep looking, because I'm going to post some results in two days. And if they do see a red dot at the edge of their field when they do update that map, I tell you what, they are, they're on the phone with us, they're <laughs> self-evaluating their practices, they're looking at their application records, they're really kind of doing an inventory to see what they may or may not have done to contribute to that which is the best thing that we could ask for, just to kind of get people engaged and, and in the process. Um, and it's really, because it is timely, that short time frame, it helps link activities to impacts. So in Whatcom County, right now, we're having a really extensively long rain season. <laughs> so we have these windows of opportunities, these small windows of opportunities for producers to get out and uh, try to make some nutrient applications. And although it might be a great application for the first three days, we could get two inches of rain seven days later, 10 days later, and it can, it can uh, give them the opportunity to learn, were their setbacks large enough? Did they have an influence? How does that affect water quality two weeks down the road, or does it not? Uh, lessons learned. You certainly don't need to be a pro. As I mentioned, the, the people who developed this had a tiny bit of knowledge in GIS but they learned a lot more throughout the process. We didn't have the funds or the resources to have a GIS Pro help us do this. There are web applications through the program that can help you develop this. Um, and the biggest outcome of this is the tools and skills that we've learned from this have developed into other projects. And we also need to keep in mind that uh, we need to evaluate what it is we're trying to convey. As I mentioned, there's probably seven or more different partners collecting water quality. And, uh, but we're collecting water quality that tells different stories. We have ambient water quality, like I mentioned, and we also have source ID water quality, which are two completely different things, so we need to keep them separate. But we are in luck that if we have four agencies that are collecting uh, source ID water quality, we can put them on the same map. Uh, we've discovered that people don't really care who's collecting the data, so we don't need to symbolize it differently. They just want to know what the data is. And also keep it simple. A number of my producers don't even have an online email account. So if I make this too complex, if I put too many bells and whistles in there, it's, it's going to get lost and it's going to be overwhelming and it might not be a tool that they choose to use. Uh, and real quick, some of the tools that have developed from this project are technical assistance tools and outreach and education tools. And I'm going to start with our nutrient tracker. Uh, this is another field application that we can use on our phones or our iPads. We can map recent uh, manure nutrient applications and we can rate them as high, medium, or low risk based on 
characteristics such as slope, soil saturation, forage, uh, proximity to surface water, setbacks, uh, predicted weather, et cetera. Um, and it basically goes into a database. And at the end of the year, we can go through this database, we can sort the number of applications that we were able to map, and out of those, what percentage were high risk ones? And if so, why were they deemed high risk? Do we see a, continu a continual trend of uh, applying nutrients before a rainstorm or bad setback? So it helps us kind of focus and hone in where we need to do continuing outreach and education in the future. And it's also a technical assistance tool where we can call the producer up in the field and say, hey, we're seeing this, is it okay if we do a field walk? Or we can go to their, visit them at their facility and kind of show them what we saw. Or we can also commend them at their next uh, routine inspection and say, hey, we mapped four of your nutrient applications and they were spot on. Good, look at this is what we did. Um, another one is a fall soil nitrate map. Uh, at WSDA, we, we collect five years worth of fall soil samples, including the nitrate levels. Uh, and what we can do is we can map those in the same way using that stoplight chromatography. Green is below level, uh, red exceeds the level. What it can do is it can allow the uh, producers to visually assess quickly uh, where they're seeing residual nitrate buildup. Uh, we can potentially use it as a compliance tool if we wanted to, <laughs> uh, but most importantly, we want to use it as an opportunity to provide technical assistance and to encourage our producers to rethink their agronomic applications and how they need to uh, disperse of their nutrients next year. And then last but not least, this is a big project. This is a dream project right now. It's going to take more than just us. It's going to take our partners to get in on it too, is a story map. And if you haven't visited a story map, make sure you Google some story maps. They're pretty amazing. They're very powerful. It's an interactive map uh, that can go over subjects with uh, really broad strokes or allow you to drill down for deeper information. It can share uh, what the current issues and concerns are, what the concerns and uh, issues are with the stakeholders, uh, corrective actions that can be taken, and um, it just kind of tells the whole story instead of one agency just telling their bit of the story. I think I did it within my time. Maybe. We have time for one or two questions. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever have just anybody from the public or citizen scientists that want to contribute data to this? No, I don't have citizen science that want to contribute data, but I do have citizen science who want more data. They want to be able to download it all in an Excel spreadsheet. We have really involved citizen science, <laughs> so they want it. They want it. They want the. They want it all. But we realized, you know, if we just put those Excel spreadsheets up on our website, most people, except for those those people who are really analytical, weren't going to dive into that. So ideally, a future step would be to have a link there where they can download those Excel spreadsheets and kind of sort them and do with them as they please. A good question. So we, we share the link with our producers. It's on WSTA's website. We share it with our partners. And we can track how many hits we get to the website, but we don't have a way to dif differentiate if it's the public or if it's the partners. So I don't know who's using it more, the field technicians or, or our producers. I know that our producers are really looking at it. And because I do get stopped so much in the field, I actually had to create business cards that said, hey, for more information on our results, please visit this link. And it also has a link where they can report uh, things that they might have seen. But I don't have a way to differentiate between too, just yet. Would that be beneficial? Absolutely, yeah. Um, what, we, what we even try to do, if we have time in our, uh, when we're doing inspections, site inspections, we want to, we, we tell our producers about, hey, have you checked out our map? And they're like, oh yeah, I looked at, it, looked at it once. If we send them the link all the time, they'll look at it, but a lot of them don't know how to save it to their desktop or to their phone. So if we can go the extra mile and just save that shortcut on their phone and on their desktop, I know that they use it. Um, any way that we get it out there, we will. What is the link? <laughs> well, you know, oh gosh, Gardner, you just pointed out one of our flaws. So the link is generated by uh, ArcGIS online, and so it's a number of really scattered letters and symbols. It does not have any meaning. So it's not like WSDAResultsMap.com. Uh, we don't have a way to, to remedy that, but I'll tell you what, I will find it and I will send it to you. <laughs> I can't even I can't tell you. I'll talk about Yeah, I know. Um, if you go to our WSDA website, Dairy Nutrient Management Program, Okay. Please help me thank Carrie.